So today I thought it would be fun to continue on showing off some pieces in my vintage fashion collection. And today I thought it would be cool to show some of the uh, handmade pieces as well as designer pieces in my collection and what their significance is to the fashion world. So if that is something that interests you, keep on watching. So this first piece is something that I'm absolutely in love with. And this is an example of a 1960s handmade piece that was heavily influenced by the space age in the 60s. And with the space age movement in fashion, they loved the modernity of it and the silver lurex and silver tinsel lurex and the really futuristic vibe that the space program was bringing to the world and that definitely showed in fashion and it was edgy it was avant-garde and not always wearable but they were certainly really fascinating and cool pieces and with this blouse in particular the one thing that i really love about it well i shouldn't say one thing one of many things that I love about it are these three quarter length bell sleeves. And this is more of a go-go top. This was meant to be worn going out. I've worn it a few times and it's lined in this almost silky taffeta. So it's not super scratchy, but it's just beautiful and sleek and elegant. But one of the biggest problems with pieces like these are the tinsel lyrix is so fragile that A, you cannot put it in your heat, otherwise it will burn. And two is the tinsel lyrix starts to flake off and disconnect. So this is a piece that I no longer wear and I keep it safe in a garment bag. Just bring it out on occasions like this. But ugh, how beautiful is this and shiny and almost unreal and ethereal in appearance. wiggle dress with beautiful beaded fringe and pieces like these are a little bit more rare to find because usually not all of the beaded fringe is left intact. One can imagine that with as much dancing and wear that a lot of these dresses received a lot of the detailing probably would have been destroyed by now but this piece is in particular a little bit of a mystery to me because it is unlabeled but it doesn't appear to have been a dress that was made by someone's mom for their school prom. It does appear that this was probably made by a dressmaker in a boutique just because of how intricate and expertly done a lot of the detailing and darting is. Now this is definitely a va va voom curve hugging wiggle dress and the fun thing is it's short enough to be sexy and you can move and dance in it freely but it's long enough to still be sophisticated to where you could even just go out in it but I particularly just love the silver fringe and how it's all wonderfully still intact the intricate iridescent sequins and Lurex roping around it. It's definitely one of my favorite wearable pieces and one that I have been known to break out from time to time, but it's just another one that holds a special place in my collection. <laughs>
myself, I wouldn't include any lingerie, but these are nightgowns, so I feel like I can kind of get away with it. But this is one of my all-time favorite vintage lingerie brands, Vanity Fair. So a little bit of back history on Vanity Fair. They actually started back in 1899, and they started off as a glove and mitten company. By 1911, they saw a huge downturn in business and ended up closing. One of the co-owners of the glove and mitten factory at that time then bought it out in 1913. And from there, they started making more silk undergarments. And by 1917, they saw a definite need in more undergarments with the resurgence of corsetry and corset covers and uh, corset skirts and all of the numerous undergarments that women had to wear in that period. Now, by 1919, since Vanity Fair mainly made undergarments out of silk, they became known as the Vanity Fair Silk Mill. And by 1930, with the invention of elastic, that really broadened what they could do as a company. Now, uh, it was hit on pause a little bit by World War II. Vanity Fair actually closed all production and ended up making parachutes for the war efforts. But once the war ended, in 1948, they decided to use nylon only in all of their undergarments, which was a really big transition and something that they're definitely known for today. And in 1949, they found a way to permanently pleat their nylon, which made a lot of their pieces a lot more decorative, ethereal, and let's face it, fun to look at. So with the combination of that extra pleating and elastic, which thank you to the heavens, because that for a lot of us women is a godsend, they really began to change the game when it came to lingerie. Now in 1953, Vanity Fair launched their most well-known, best-selling, and iconic line, and that is their line of leopard print nightgowns and nighties, and I'll be showing an example of this in just a moment, but they created leopard print, zebra print, and butterfly print, and those are definitely the most well-known, sought-after pieces that people want from Vanity Fair in their collections. Now, in the 1960s, they ended up buying out Lee Jeans and went on to buy out famous lines such as Wrangler, Janssen, and Vassarette. But in 2007, they were bought out by Fruit of the Loom, but they still have that long legacy of creating really beautiful and iconic vintage fashion pieces from boudoir robes, nightgowns, bustiers, you name it. Now, apart from the leopard print pieces from Vanity Fair that I have in my collection, this is my all-time favorite nightgown by them, and this is from the early 1960s, and you can see it's so beautifully ethereal. Just look at the little details on the sleeves and the gathered ruching right at the bust, and ugh, just look at this corset effect waistline. It's amazing. It's hard not to feel like a glamorous old Hollywood screen star in this. And this is really what they were known for. They created really beautiful, ethereal, but affordable pieces that if this is something that you want to collect, you can still find today, whether it be on eBay, Etsy, or even in vintage shops. It's super accessible and definitely something you would be able to get your hands on. And I refer to this one as the Tarzan nighty because at the bottom, and I'll show you in just a moment, it's kind of got this shark's tooth 
type cut at the bottom, very reminiscent of when you see Tarzan and kind of those stereotypical loincloth type outfits. And this is something that's really cheeky. It was really edgy at that time, but it's still classy and not tacky in any way. And it's definitely one of my favorites. And this is a piece that I could totally see someone going out and about, going to a party, going out to dinner, because it's just that interesting and cool. And it's definitely a conversation starter. fashion collection and this is one that I truly treasure and I'm just enamored by every time I see it and that is this early 1950s what is called tree bark silk taffeta tent coat by Seal Chapman. Seal Chapman is widely considered to have been one of Marilyn Monroe's favorite designers and upon doing a little research that is quite a sweeping statement because it seems like there were a lot of people that were Marilyn Monroe's favorite designers but Seal Chapman was definitely a designer for the stars. She created pieces for Marilyn Monroe, Grace Kelly, I mean the list goes on and on and on but another one of her more famous designs was the 1950 wedding between Elizabeth Taylor and Conrad Nicky Hilton, who was the great uncle of Paris and Nicky Hilton. And she really knew how to drape. She knew how to create these really constructive, amazing sculptural designs. And that's something that she will always be known for. And that's what really makes a lot of her pieces collectible to this day. Now, Seal Chapman definitely was a high-end designer, and to put that in perspective, at her height in the 1950s, in the early 1950s, the average yearly household income was just over $3,000, and in 1959, it became a little over $5,000. So if you, at that time, wanted to acquire a Seal Chapman piece for yourself, you would be paying at least $1,000 for that garment. Now, if you think about that in the early 1950s, that was a third of your yearly income. So it's not hard to imagine just how rare these pieces are to find today if they're not in a museum, just because they were so expensive and not very easily attainable. But one of my most favorite photographs I've seen of this tent coat was a gold version that Grace Kelly actually had been photographed in in the 1950s. And these are museum quality pieces. I have done extensive research and I've never seen another pink one like it. There is a gold version up for auction on eBay and I think it's going for around $3,000. But these really are highly collectible rare pieces that if you do have them, it's definitely an investment piece and you have to do your best to ensure that these are well taken care of because this is a piece, again, it should be in a museum and one day I'd like to get it there, but uh, Seal Chapman's pieces are beautiful and if you're lucky enough to have any of her pieces in your collection, hold on to it for dear life. But this is one of my favorites. You guys, come on, look at it. It's beautiful. The color, ugh, I'm never going to let it go. But thank you so much, you guys. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. If, again, this is something that you want to see, let me know because I have tons more pieces that I can pull on out of storage and show you guys. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye.